You can open your Bibles to, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21. I'll go ahead and read it. You can follow along. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Father, we want to ask your blessings on your word. I pray that you would uh, far exceed what I think my expectations are in, in the message like this. Lord, run wild with this. Run in our hearts with this. Proclaim truth, Lord, in areas that maybe we didn't even see coming, areas where we need it. Minister to us, and, and even beyond this sanctuary, Lord, through Your Word, as Your Holy Spirit shoots it directly at our hearts, at our point of need. So, Father, I yield this to You, and I pray that You would... Lord, as always, I pray to, to even have that gift of prophecy to speak out of things that I didn't even see coming, that I didn't even prepare for, but things that you're giving me right now, Lord, to communicate. Let me just be an instrument, a conduit for, for your truth to flow through. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you, you teach us. You've got to be the one to teach us. And so I want to yield that to you, and may we yield all of this time in your word to you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, you come to a you come to a text of Scripture like this, and it's one of those things to where, again, you could probably go outside of the walls of church, people who've never been in church, maybe never even read their Bible, and, and say, tell me one thing about Jesus that you know. He walked on water. That's probably a universal thing that people know about Jesus. Um, and I kind of I want to approach this in a way, we're going to take the text in John initially for what it is and where it's at, but... This is kind of a condensed version of what Jesus is doing, especially in Matthew chapter 14, and we'll get to that. It's an expanded version. There's a lot more stuff going on than John gives us in this, things going on with Peter, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but again, whatever John tells us in this portion of Scripture is, again, to remind us that Jesus is the Christ. And that we are to believe in Him, and by believing in Him, we have eternal life in His name. So that's why it's included. Why is it shorter? Uh, why is it more a condensed version than, than the other Gospels? I don't know, but God inspired it to be this way. And here's the, the cool thing about it. We don't just have John's Gospel. We've got Matthew. And we've got the other uh, Gospels that we can go to and visit and get an expanded version of what's taking place. We, this is our text, but we can go and get a little more insight into what's, what's happening. But regardless, this is a miracle. And again, I want us to, to plug in the definition of what a miracle is when we see something like this. And a miracle is where God divinely overcomes something that's natural. We've all been swimming. Anybody jump off the edge into water? We've all done that. You ever tried to walk on water? I think all kids do it. You know, hey, I'm going to walk on. You don't get real far when you try to walk on water because you can't do it. It's not natural. But here we have God in the flesh, God who created water. You think about that. God created water to be exactly the way that it is. And He created it in the way that you are not supposed to be able to walk on water. It's just not natural. It's not the way that it's been done. It's not the properties that are within water. But on the third day, when you go to Genesis in the creation time, the third day, the seas were gathered into one place, and God made dry land appear. Now, why did He make that dry land appear? One thing, to kind of harness the seas, but also to walk upon to have vegetation grow on, to live. We walk on dry land. We were never intended to walk upon water. But here we find Jesus doing just that. And so in this text, I want to, like I said, I want to take it for as it is in, in the true text of John first. 
You see what's happening here. The disciples, they, they're on the sea. They're traveling across to Capernaum. Jesus isn't there. It's dark out. And there's a strong wind that's taking place. And often that would happen on the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of got this bowl effect that storms would pop up real fast. And they'd be kind of, you know, strong winds and prevailing winds and all of these things. And it would happen almost without knowing because you've got to remember, these were fishermen. They knew the seas. They knew the tides. They knew these kind of things that would go on. But they're out there. They're rowing. They're against the wind. But here's the one thing that I find amazing about this. They're out about three miles. There's wind, three to four miles. And they see Jesus walking on the sea. Walking. You don't find from John's text in any of the text about this event that Jesus is stumbling on the sea or he's tripping over the waves. It just clearly says he's walking on the sea. It's as if the winds that were making it difficult for the men to row weren't affecting him at all in his walking. He's just walking. You know, and, and it's hard, and I'm, I'm a real visual person when it comes to these kind of things, so I have in my mind what I, what I think it would look like. And, you know, he's just, he's just walking. It's as if he's walking just as normal as I'm walking right now, and that's what he's doing on top of the sea, on top of this where the men, and don't think for a moment, you know, there are skeptics everywhere. And they want to explain away the miraculous. And oh, you know, I read uh, even this morning, well, he wasn't really walking on the water. He was walking along the coast. And that's why when he got in the boat, they were already on the other side. No. I mean, that's just, that's just foolishness. That's silliness. That doesn't even, it's not even consistent with what the scripture would say. Or I don't know how you even get to that point. No, it didn't freeze over. You know, there's, there's, this is a miracle. He's walking on top of the water. He's not tripping. He's not wandering around either. You know, he's not just walking, not sure where he's going. Because again, if you've ever stood on a coast or on a shore and looked out and tried to, to see, I don't know how far three or four miles are without actually having a marker, but you can't really see. When we lived in Florida, we lived uh, along Lake Okeechobee. And Lake Okeechobee, I think it's 40 miles, uh, 20 miles across, I think 40 miles north and south. It's, it's a pretty big lake, very shallow, about 12 feet deep. But, but regardless, you could stand there and you know, real flat, as far as the, the area around it. And you could look out, and you're only going to see so far. And I thought, you know, if there was a boat out there, and I just take off walking, it's, I may get off a little bit, because there's no trail that's left here. You know, it's not like they were just dropping uh, little floaties to help Jesus out, because they had no idea what was going to happen. They're traveling across. But here you find Jesus. They're three or four miles out there, and he's walking. And it says that Jesus was walking on the, wa on the sea, coming near the boat. He's right there with them. They're sitting there and they're, they're straining to get across here, but Jesus is walking on the water, not tripping, and he's walking right where they are. He knew exactly where they were. And so he's walking over to them. And there's a lot of principles that I want us to take from what's going on here. No matter where we are in life, no matter, because you know, there are times in life where we feel like we are absolutely out in the middle of the sea and nobody knows where we are. That we're just drifting and the winds are just pushing us back. We try to move forward in our, in our life and in our faith. And the more we try, the harder the winds just come against us. And quite frankly, that's the Christian life. Because when you become a follower of Christ, you are going against the flow. You are. The world is, is following uh, the God of this age. It is following the prince of the air. It is following Satan as the world as a whole goes. And when you come to faith in Christ, you are pushing against that. And there are times in faith, and, and the devil loves to do this, come up to, to a follower's ear and whisper, you're all alone. There's nobody around. There's nobody who understands. Where's your Lord? Well, we may not realize it. We may not be expecting it. But guess what? He knows exactly where we are. And these, these difficult times and these, these tempests that we face, they don't affect Him. He's moving toward us. He's already... And the thing about it is, they're struggling here to get across the sea. But how long does it take to walk three or four miles? Considerable amount of time. So Jesus, by the time they get there and they're struggling trying to get across, Jesus has already been moving toward them. And so that's the thing in our lives. We might face a difficult trial and think, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Well, Jesus has already been moving toward this situation long before we ever knew it was going to be a situation. 
And so Jesus here, He knows exactly where they are. He's walking these three or four miles, and He's coming right to them. And and it wasn't like He was walking and said, Oh, there you are. I didn't know quite where you were. He knows where they are. He knows exactly where they are, and He comes near to them. But I love their response. They're afraid. They're scared. And He says to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And every time that you see Jesus say, Don't be afraid, He says that because they were afraid. And we find out in Matthew, and we'll get there in just a second, that they thought he was a ghost because this was so unnatural. This was not the kind of thing they were expecting. They're like, oh, hey, we left Jesus behind. I mean, I wonder what was going through their heads. They probably thought, well, he'll catch a boat later because we'll find out in Matthew what he was doing when they left. But I can guarantee they did not expect him to be walking on the water to meet them. So this was a surprise, this was a shock to them. But here's an interesting thing about what he says here. It is I. In the Greek, that can also be translated, I am. So what is he saying there? They're afraid, here he is, and he comes to them and he speaks his covenant name, I am. And you think of all the things that were tied into that covenant name that he gives to Moses to give to the Israelites because Moses is going back to to be used of God to deliver them from Egypt, to deliver them from Pharaoh. And he says, who am I going to say who sends me? They're going to ask, who is it that has sent you? And he says, tell them, I am has sent you. And so you look at that, and I am, and you see deliverance there. And Jesus walking across this sea, coming to these men, and he speaks to them, I am. Don't be afraid. I am. I am with you. I am. I will be. All of these things are tied up into the translation of that. And so Jesus is coming, and His presence alone should be enough. There's a great principle for us in our lives. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we we see in our lives, what's happening, we have to remember that God is the great I am. He's right there with us. He's not left us. He's not forsaken us. He hasn't wandered off the course and forgot that we were over here and then He's over here looking for us. He knows right where we are. But turn back now to Matthew chapter 14. I want to fill in some blanks here. Get a little insight of of what's going on. Because with something so familiar, you, you want to kind of... You know, just touch on it a little bit. Because otherwise everybody's thinking, well, what about Peter? What about the other things that were taking place? So Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, and I won't give a lot of commentary on this, but we'll kind of read through it. Now this is after the feeding of the 5,000. He says in verse 22, Immediately he made the disciples get in the boat. So Jesus is telling them, get in the boat and go before him, go before me to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. So the crowds that have gathered there, that, that they were fed, he tells the disciples, get in the boats, and he's on some level dismissing them. But then after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now remember what was happening that we find out in the Gospel of John, that they were fed, they were amazed at what he had done, and remember, they wanted to take him by force and make him their king. They thought, here he comes, the one who's going to overthrow the Romans. He is our king. We want this. This is the judge that's going to be raised up by God and overthrow our oppressor. But we find out he dismisses the crowds and he goes up and he's praying. What was he praying about? We don't know exactly, but it has to relate to this somehow, I would imagine. It has to relate somehow because, remember Jesus was tempted in the desert by the devil and a lot of it was to skirt around going to the cross. Bow to me, I'll give you all this. You think about what's happening here and here Jesus is and he's given this bread, and they want to make him king. You know, I think he was revisiting, this is not why I came. I didn't come to be an earthly king. I came to die. I came to die on the cross. So I think that a lot of times when Jesus is seen off to go off by himself and to pray, those were such intimate times, such intimate times with his Father. But I I have to believe that it's just a revisiting of why he came. Not that he was tempted to go off course, but you even think in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any way to take this cup, uh, remove it from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So there's always these times, and 100% God, 100% human, uh, this humanity thing that he's, that he's dealing with, that he has, the frailty of being human, he had to go back and get strength. He had to go back and, and stay on the course and be strengthened by God to continue the path that he's on. And so he's off praying by himself. When evening came, he was there alone. 
But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So as they're traveling these three or four miles, the wind is pushing back against them. Fourth watch of the night, it's getting close to, to dawn. It's not far off, but it's, it's pretty dark at this point. He came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. Again, that's, that's why they were scared. John just, we just know they were scared, but they thought he was a ghost. Because again, this is such a, a foreign concept. They weren't thinking in the back of their minds, oh, Jesus is going to come walking on the water. But that's exactly what he did. And so he's coming, he's making their way there, they're scared to death, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Again, there's such a peace that comes with the presence of Jesus. It's just something that you you have to experience. You can't understand it unless you experience it. And then verse 28, And Peter answered him, I love Peter. Are you guys impetuous? (laughs) <laughs> Peter. Peter's just one of these guys, you know, and I think about this and I think about uh, after the resurrection and, and he's out there with James and John and, and he realizes it's the Lord on the shore and he jumps off the boat and he starts swimming while they just kind of row back, you know. That's just the kind of guy Peter was. Somebody comes to arrest him, he pulls out a sword and chops off his ear, you know, trying to lap off his head. That's just the kind of guy Peter was. And I, and I love it because he was a new creation in Christ. But he was still the personality of Peter. I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I can just beat myself up on my personality. It's like, oh, why do I do this? Why am I like this? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But I'm a new creation in Christ. And so sometimes we just kind of maybe need to lighten up on ourselves a little bit and realize that I'm in Christ. There's nothing going to change that. I'm not perfect. And if you're impetuous, you know, take heart. So is Peter. But, I, but there's something out of this that I want us to, to catch that I always do this with the teens. We have, we have, with the teens, when we get together, we do Bible trivia. And I ask them a particular question because I want them to understand it, not just for the answer, but to understand why I'm asking it. The question is, how many people walked on the water? So quick. Oh, Jesus walked on the water. It's one. So no, there were two. There were two who walked on the water. Peter walked on the water. It was just for a moment. But he actually got out of the boat and walked on the water. How amazing is that? You know, he came back and, and you know, you kind of know how, how men can be. And there's a group of men and, and Peter, after he's sinking down and Jesus pulls him out, you know, he gets back in the boat and the men were probably looking at him like, ah, you know, a loser. You fell down, you know, you didn't keep it going. But he kind of looked back at them and said, I did it. I walked on the water. There's such a principle there. You know, to go out and, and, and to, to get out of your comfort zone. And, and yeah, maybe it doesn't look perfect to everybody else, but, but you're out there. You're doing it. And so Peter cries out to the Lord. He says, Lord, if it is you, little doubt there. I mean, these guys, again, they're dealing with somebody walking on the water. So from that sense, it's so supernatural. But he says, command me to come to you on the water. He understood that if Jesus says, walk on the water, he's going to walk on the water. And so Jesus does it. He says, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. There it is. He's doing it. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him. You know, that's, that's, that's our Lord. You know, he, wasn't, he could have said, oh, Peter, you know, you took your eyes off of me. You know, suffer. You deserve this. Again, Peter's a fisherman. So I have to think he knew how to swim. I have to think that. I mean, this was his livelihood. You would think it'd be pretty silly to be a fisherman out in the sea and not know how to swim. But regardless, he's sinking. And he realizes that the only way he's going to get help is Jesus. And I love it. Jesus takes his hand, pulls him out. Sometimes that's our faith. We find ourselves sinking. But there's a bigger principle here that I believe is taking place. When Peter's walking on the water, two things are happening. Number one, his focus is Jesus. And secondly, it is Jesus who is enabling him to walk on the water. Now here's the principle that that I want want us to take from this. Years ago, um, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, at a conference, and I was I was going through a, a tough time with with a, a person at our church in in Florida, and I'll never forget this. I walked down to the Ohio River and just kind of stood there on the bank, thinking and praying through this this person that I was having some some difficult times with, and I realized something as I looked at this water. 
And I don't think I'd heard this message, but I was looking at the water and seeing some boats going by. And I realized that I have as much ability to walk or to love this person as Peter did to walk on the water. And my point in that is, if I'm going to love somebody who's unlovable, I'm only going to do it in the strength of Christ. It's only going to be Him enabling me to do this. And you can expand upon that even more. To live the Christian life is only going to be happening in our lives when we are dependent upon Jesus to do that. So approach that in your, in your Christian walk. And, and if you come up with struggles, realize... I have about as much ability to get through this on my own as Peter had ability to walk on water by himself. Because he had no ability to do that. The only thing that got him out there walking on the water, the only thing that was sustaining him was Christ. But there's something bigger here too. Jesus takes his eyes off Jesus. And we know from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it speaks about that making Jesus our focus. I'll go ahead and read that. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning verse 1, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, or fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. That's the Christian walk. It's not perfect, and it has some some stumbles and some falls and some times... But here's the thing I want us to remember. If we take our focus off of Jesus, we're sunk, just like Peter was. But here's the faithfulness of the Lord, that He's not going to deny us, that when we realize, okay, I've taken my focus off you, I'm sinking, rescue me, what does He do? He reaches down and He pulls us up and He gets us back on the track that we need to be on because He is faithful and He won't deny Himself. And so that's where Peter was. And then he gives a little rebuke. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? But who was he talking to there? Was he just talking to Peter? I don't think so. He could have been talking to those other guys who were sitting in the boat nice and dry. The little smirks on their face. Like, oh, look at Peter. Impetuous Peter. He's soaking wet now. But he could have been talking to those guys. You didn't even get out of the boat. You didn't step one foot on water. You took not one step on top of the water. This drenched man right here did. He experienced something that you guys will never experience. And yes, he learned a valuable lesson. Don't take your eyes off Christ. Don't look around at the waves. Don't look around at the, at the wind, all of these things. When you're in the midst of the tempest, keep your eyes focused on Christ. And then when he got in the boat, verse 32 of Matthew 14, when he got in the boat, the wind ceased. It was it. It was done. So that tells me that the wind had a purpose. And the purpose was completed. And the wind ceased when Jesus was ready for it to cease. Not any time sooner, not any time later. And those in the boat worshipped Him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. This was a sign. This was a miracle. This was something that communicated something far more than just somebody walking on the top of the water. But there's one thing, and you can go back to to John chapter 6 now. I want to close with this because I feel like this is what's being developed here throughout the context of these chapters 5 and and 6. And we've been dealing with it for a long time now. And it kind of begins or continues to a point at the end of chapter 5. The end of chapter 5. And Jesus is talking with the Jewish religious leaders. And He's giving testimonies and these things testified about who He was. And he says in verse 45, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. He says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you may not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So there's a context there that's been developed here with Jesus and Moses and how so many of the religious leaders were putting their faith in Moses. And again, I I think I touched on it two weeks ago where it's no doubt that Jesus is obviously superior to Moses and he's communicating that. And when we went to Jesus feeding the 5,000, part of that was the manna that fell down from heaven that God provided for them while they were in the desert moving toward the promised land those 40 years. And Jesus says this later in the the chapter. He says that those who ate the manna, those who ate the bread from heaven, they ate it and they died. That's it. But remember the bread that Jesus is going to give, which is Himself, you eat of Him, you're not going to die. 
And you remember the manna that fell, they could only get as much for that day unless it, was, uh, unless it was the Sabbath. But if they tried to keep a little over, it would rot, it would, become, it would stink, and it would have worms all in it. But you remember all that was left here when Jesus feeds 5,000 were 12 basketfuls. So it wasn't turning into to rotten bread the next day. So there's a superiority that's found there with Moses, or with Jesus over Moses. But I also find one here with Jesus walking on the water. And I'm okay with this because there is quite a context of Moses. The end of chapter 5, and then he deals with it more down in John chapter 6, verse 32, talking about Moses again. And here's what I find, the superiority of Jesus over Moses. Remember what happened with Moses? Remember in the Exodus? And they were hemmed in, and, and they had the Red Sea in front of them. They had the mountains that had hemmed them in, and you had the rumble of Pharaoh's chariots coming toward them. There was nowhere to go. And God uses Moses. Moses raises up his, his hands, and God provides that wind that parts the sea and allows them to pass through the sea on dry land. Jesus is in allowing his disciples to pass through the sea on dry land. Where was Peter at? He's on top of the water. Where's Jesus? He's on top of the water. He's not parting the sea and they're not traveling through on dry land. He is rising above his creation, supremely above his creation. And I see this that while Moses passed through the sea, Jesus walks upon the sea. And it just creates such a superiority. And he's having, and and never forget, as Jesus is communicating to uh, the religious leaders of his day, he's also communicating truth about himself to his disciples. He's also communicating to them that he is superior to Moses. Because they would have been brought up in that same way and they would have put so much faith into Moses and and in in the law and all these things. And he's trying to show them that He is superior to these things. And so here Jesus is. Moses walks through the water. Jesus walks upon the water. And all of the foreshadowing within the Old Testament of Jesus, concerning Jesus, concerning the Messiah, is always eclipsed by His actual presence. Those things, there were so many pictures and so many shadows and so many things, prophecies that were pointing toward Christ. But when he comes to them in in actual form and living these things out, he always eclipses those. And you realize how much of a shadow they really were because here he is and you see the parting of the sea and you see what God is able to do in the Old Testament and then you see God in the flesh walking on top of the water. That greatly eclipses the, any kind of foreshadowing that was found concerning the one to come as they pass through the Red Sea. But here's one thing I want us to take. This is it's kind of an application here about Jesus and about this. You know, Jesus walking down the water, very familiar. There is such a, a danger for us in the church to become very complacent about Jesus. To even come to a scripture like this and be like, yeah, I've heard this before. Yeah, Jesus walks on the water. You know, I've read it a million times. I understand it. But we are never to become complacent about Jesus because here's the thing. The minute you think you got your hold on Jesus, guess what he's going to do? He's going to walk on the water and blow your mind. You know, here the disciples are. They had just witnessed Jesus taking five loaves and two fish and feeding probably upwards of 20,000 people. They had to be thinking, wow, man, what greater things is he going to do? Wow, this, this Jesus, we're with him. Man, he is, he is a miracle worker. He's done something incredible. But realize, and we don't find this, they didn't bow to him in worship after he did this miraculous thing with the five loaves and two fish. But here he is walking on the water, blowing their minds anew and afresh. And what do they do when he gets in the boat? They bow and they worship him. So that tells me the minute you think, okay, you know, I kind of got this. I know who Jesus is. I think I'm, I think I'm there. He's going to do something that just blows our minds and we realize there is so much more to know about Jesus and that if we just become complacent about Him and just sort of come and, yeah, Jesus, you know, and His name and His presence and His reality should always have such a freshness in our lives, and in our relationship with Him, because He's alive. He's alive, and we are alive in Him. And we look to the cross and what He's done through His death, burial, and resurrection. And I realize that we should be, as believers, in a constant state of revival. 
We should be begging for that. A lot of times we think, oh, revival, we only need it when we've kind of gotten off the path. I think we need it daily. Daily, because it is so easy to become so familiar with the truth of Jesus and the stories of Jesus. And this is my own warning. This is, this is on me. I'm not just preaching to you. You get so familiar with a text of Scripture and the Gospels that it's almost like, yeah, I've been there, done that kind of attitude. But then Jesus is alive, alive today, active. His Word is living and active. And He can take a portion of Scripture that you didn't even know was in the Bible and apply that to your heart and just blow your minds and bring such a freshness into your relationship with Him, just like those disciples on that boat. They're there. They've just seen Him do something incredible. They've already seen Him uh, turn water into wine. They've seen Him heal an invalid of 38 years. They've seen some incredible stuff. And they maybe were thinking, wow, you know, on some level, we're, we're beginning to figure this guy out a little bit. And here he comes walking on the water. Scares them to death. I bet they were embarrassed about that, to be afraid. But here they are, scared to death. He says, be at peace. It's me. It is I. I am. I'm here. I'm with you. He gets in the boat. The waves stop. The wind stops. And they worship him. That's what we need in our lives. To realize that, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living this Christian life, and it's not easy, but I'm pushing forward. We need to be looking around for Jesus to come walking on the water to us. Because He hasn't left us, He hasn't forsaken us. We've not progressed in our relationship with Him to where He's like, okay, I think you got this. I'll meet you at the end. I'll meet you on the other side. He doesn't do that. He's with us. He's with us constantly. And so that's what I want us to leave us with today is a desire to be revived by Him constantly, to be refreshed in our relationship with Him constantly, every day, to approach Him with such a, not an attitude of, okay, Jesus, you know, I know you and you know me and, and we're good, but just, and not to, I don't want to minimize it with this phrase, but just come to Jesus and say, just amaze me today. Amaze me. Walk on the water when I'm not expecting it. Do something that absolutely is beyond the, the confines of my mind and just go above and beyond because that's what he does. He's able to go exceedingly abundantly more than we can think or imagine. How do you think the disciples thought he was going to get to the other side? On a boat. And he walked on water. Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you. Thank you that you walked on water. Not just for the sake of that you walked on water, but the truth that's communicated through it. That you are God, that you are over your creation, you know where we are, you know who we are, what we're going through. You give us the ability to do those things that we could never do on our own. And Jesus, you are so far above your creation. You're so far above even, you're supreme over, over Moses. Lord, you, you're the Messiah, Jesus. We thank you for that. And in the same ability that you gave Peter to walk on water, give us the ability to live for you, to love you, revive us in that same power that you had, that you exhibited as you walked upon the water. Revive us, refresh us, blow our minds, Lord. May we never become complacent in you. Don't just be a part of our lives, be our life. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. So take these truths, Jesus, plant them deep in our hearts, and may they bear fruit to the glory of your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.